So I've been doing a little research. Uh, I, I found out that about 70% of people in America have the need of either glasses or contacts. And typically, the people with contacts are younger people. They're a little bit more concerned about their, eye, not their eyesight, but how they look while fixing their eyesight. And I was thinking about the magic of glasses. That The idea is I can only see so well, but if I put on glasses, if I put in contacts, I then have the ability to see what I could not see before. Um, for instance, you'll notice that I'm wearing glasses today, but there's actually no lenses in them. I don't actually wear glasses. When I was a teacher, uh, high school history teacher, I actually went and got a pair of fake ones, wore them in one day, and all the kids were like, I didn't know you wore glasses. I would say something like, well, they're on my face, aren't they? And I'd carry on. About three days later, they figured out, those aren't even real. Right? But the, the purpose of real glasses is to alter the way you see the world. I heard a story of a guy who was driving along in traffic safety, learning to drive, and the guy said, take this exit. And the kid driving was like, what exit? The exit. What exit? And then finally he saw the sign when he was right on it. It's not a good time to figure out that you need glasses while you're driving. That is not the time that I want to be doing that. But what I've noticed is that when you have something that you put over the way that you see the world, when you put different types of glasses on, it allows you to see it differently. And if you've been a part of our Colossians series, you've noticed that we've come back to the same thing over and over and over again. And essentially what we're saying is, this is the type of glasses that you have to put on. And it's a simple one. It's, it's the, the glasses of the gospel, that you see the world through this lens, that God has an amazing story and he's asking us to be a part of it. And gospel simply means good news. And here's the simple story, that God created the world and he created a perfect world. But shortly after that, there was a problem that Adam and Eve brought sin into the world. And now we have a fall. And now because of that, there's a disconnect between us and between God. But there's a redemption story. It's the story of Jesus Christ who lived a perfect life, something we can't do. And in the process, he then died on the cross for us and then rose three days later so that we can have this restored relationship. And then in the end, the end of the story is that we will be a new creation. It'll go back to what it was at the beginning. This is the gospel story. It is the power of God to save us from our sins. We've been looking at this in Colossians 1 and in Colossians 2, and it was the heartbeat of last week when we talk about what it means to have peace with each other and have peace with God. It all is predicated on this story and we want to do is say, what would it look like if our entire life was seen through the lens of the gospel? If it was seen through that story. So we're going to be in Colossians chapter 4, and we're going to look at really specifically the first six verses. And so if you have your Bibles, you can turn there. You can do that on your app. We are going to be looking just real plainly at the first six verses, and then I'm going to tell you a few little stories that come with it. So first verse, let's pick it up right there. It says, masters provide for your slaves with what is right and fair. And right away, let's just make it awkward in here. The moment he says this, masters provide for your slaves. This is one of the great biblical writers. He's written 13 books of the New Testament. He's writing a critical letter. And look what he says. He says, masters, not free your slaves. Masters, provide for your slaves. For this is right and fair because you know that you have a master in heaven. Let's just stop and pause for a second and bring some clarity, because if we try and avoid this, or if we try and work around it, we're not understanding the context of this. Whenever an American sees the word slavery, we have a thought in our minds. It's a thought of racism and degradation. It's about brutality. It's horrible and horrific. But I want you to understand something. The Apostle Paul was writing this almost 2,000 years ago to a different culture with a different economic system. And when they said masters, provide for your slaves, they were not saying the same thing because a slave comes from the word dunas. And in the mix, midst of that, the word dunas means something very different. It's what we would call more like an indentured servitude. In fact, it had nothing to do with race. It was an economic term. Usually when someone made a poor economic decision, they then had to sell themselves into slavery, usually for a period of about seven years, depending on the amount of debt that they owed, where they would be a the closer phrase here is a bond servant. I have to pay off the bond, and so I will come underneath you. And here's what he's saying. Those of you who have authority, be careful how you treat those under you. You know why? Because you're under someone with an authority. Look at this. See how it's capitalized? That's because this is a picture of God. And so he's saying this. Hey, if you have authority over someone, if you're going to see the world through the lens and the glasses of the gospel, understand this, that you may be over someone, but you are under someone. And if you are going to not provide for them, realize how much has been provided for you. We'll just play this out for a second. Everyone do this for me. Just take a breath. You didn't earn that. 
That was a gift from the master who has just, just now, you were just a part of it, provided something for you. The essence of this, and I think this is so critical that Paul is saying here, you better understand authority. You better understand that the moment you look at the person under you, and let's just put it in our context, you, maybe you have someone that works for you, you are over them in the same way. How you respond to them, how you act towards them is of great importance because you have to remember you are also under someone else. I'll just ask you a quick, quick question, flip back to the, the text here. Which one do you identify with most, the master or the slave? Some of you are thinking, if, if you're having a problem with a boss, you're definitely feeling this over here. And if you, you're having a problem with someone that works for you, maybe you're feeling over here. Here's my observation just of American society. As, as a whole, most of us actually fit in in identifying more with the master. You know why? The master is always the one with the rights, and Americans have a lot of rights. And I would actually give a caution here. And on your outline, I want you to write this underneath the word understand authority. I want you to write the word rights, because you'll need to understand this, that there are moments when rights come and rights go. But the real question is this, how do you relate to the ultimate master? Because if your anger leads you into a revolt or a conflict, be really careful because what you're saying is that you were entitled to something when in actuality everything you have is a gift from God, which is a very, very, very different play than thinking to yourself, this is mine and I ought to have it. So see this through this lens because here's what I deserve what you deserve, what the people over you deserve, and the people under you deserve. We all deserve hell. But here's the story of the gospel. Creation, fall, that's where we're living in. And then Jesus Christ gave his life for us so that we can have relationship with God. So number one, I want you to know that it's so critical that from this you need to understand authority, that there are those over you, there are those under you, and all of us are provided for by the Father. Number one, understand authority. He goes on in, in verse two. He says, devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful. And then in verse three, he says, pray for us too, that God may open a door for our message so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains. Because right now, remember, so we've been talking, uh, Paul is in a Roman prison and he's writing a letter to Colossae on the other side of the Aegean Sea saying, hey, here's some key critical things. And while he's saying this, hey man, this is the end of the letter. This is the final thing I'm saying to you. Would you please pray for us? Pray that our message would be heard and pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should. Here's an amazing thing. Here's Paul in prison and he's saying, oh, by the way, with great humility, he says to those people on the other side of a, a sea, would you please be praying for me? Not only does he want you to understand authority, he also wants you to have a devotion to prayer, a connection with prayer. And as he does that, I can't help but think about what type of prayer he's calling us to. He actually doesn't say this, but I've made a couple observations about how prayer works, and I'd like to give them to you. I don't think that I see this in the Bible. This is something that I'm definitely inferring, but I've noticed that I think there's a hierarchy of prayer requests. There are some that are more important than others. And I would say that the bottom level is probably something physical, that there's something wrong with my body. And one of the, I've heard this once from a very wise um, older person who said the beauty of physical problems is that it reminds us to pray. And I think that's really true. And have you ever been going through a day where you're like, everything's fine, and then you tweak your knee, and you're like, oh, Jesus, help me. Oh, Lord, I need you. Lord, will you provide for me? And suddenly... Your pain reminds you that there is a God in heaven and that he is a healer. There's a beautiful part of that. In fact, the Apostle Paul at one point has a, what he called a thorn in the flesh, and we don't know what that was. Is it something physical that he had a stomach problem? Um, we don't know what it is, but we know that he cried out to God three times asking for healing. But I would say I don't think that physical healing is the most important thing to pray for. I think there's something higher than that. I think that there's physical, but then I think there's emotional. And if you've ever felt real emotional pain— you know that sometimes that's even more painful than physical. When the heart's breaking, when you hear those words, the marriage is over, when you hear the thing, it's cancer, when you hear those words that break your heart, I think that that's a higher form of prayer. But I don't think that's the highest one. I think there's something even more important than the emotional things that we go through. I think there's the eternal things. I want you to stop and think about all of the people that Jesus healed while here on earth. 
Think of all of his miracles. He turns the water into wine. The leper is cleansed. His skin is clean. The guy that can't walk, get up and walk. All of the miracles of Jesus, with the exception of the resurrection from the dead for himself, every one of those people he healed, they all died. Every one of those miracles was short-lived. All of them, my favorite is Lazarus. Jesus raises him from the dead. He dies again. It only lasts so long. So be thinking about this. There's a hierarchy, what matters most. And even if you go above the physical to the emotional, that's not the greatest level of, 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 of need in the world. It's to go beyond this world, and it's the eternal. So listen to what he says here. Uh, uh, go back to that prayer. Paul is in prison. If I were in prison, let me show you how I would write the text. And pray for us, too, that God may open a door for our jail. The food here is really terrible. It's horrible in here. Get me out. He's in chains. Now, erase that for a second. Let's read what he says. Because my idea is what's temporal. I can't see my friends. It's physically painful. There's a problem in here. And look what he says. Pray for us, too, that God may open a door for our, not jail, but for our message so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains. I am in prison here because there is a mission bigger than myself. There's something more profound than whether or not I'm physically okay, whether or not I'm emotionally okay. This guy was living out social distancing long before it was in vogue in 2020 and 2021. He was stuck in a home on house arrest. And his prayer was not for something small but something seminal it was about whether or not people knew Jesus because the lens through which he saw the world was there was a creation and there was a fall and there's a story of redemption where Jesus Christ died and rose again and all that matters is whether or not people fall in love with him so number one Paul's saying we need to understand authority but he also says it's critical that we have a devotion to prayer he goes on in, in verses uh, 5 and 6. He says, Be wise in the way that you act toward outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation always be full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. What's the whole point of this in verses 5 and 6? It's what goes on on the inside. And I love this word seasoned. He says that you're full of grace, but then there's a seasoning there. Have you ever worked with actual seasoning? Raise your hand if you dig grilling. I'm a, I just, I love when you turn fire on. Actually, I just like when you should put anything on fire. But then the idea that you're going to turn something on with fire, and then you're going to put food on it, and it's going to taste amazing. I want you to picture a steak. And some of you are already hungry, aren't you? Focus. Stay with me here. But picture the steak on the grill. And it's sizzling, and it's moving, and you got it. And you, need, you wait the seven minutes, and you flip it over, and you can smell the fire, and you can smell the meat. Yeah, and you pull it off. You pull it off, you put it on a plate. And then I want you to picture this. You have the cooked steak, and then you take your seasoning, and you put it on top. And some of you, I know you're saying what I'm saying. That is a crime against humanity. What are you doing? You don't season the steak after you cooked it. Come on. This is America. The land of the free and the home of the hot dog. I don't know. The idea is if you're going to season properly, you take the steak the day before. You get yourself a nice Ziploc bag, a sturdy one. Don't get those cheap ones from the Dollar Tree. You need a real one. And you put some avocado oil in there. And then you put your mojito lime seasoning inside. And you seal it. You shake it up. And you put it in the fridge. And you walk away and you give it time because there's a difference between seasoning and marinating, and I'll tell you this, notice this, full of grace and seasoned with salt. This same thing is true with how you relate with the world. Far too many of us, we are not seasoned in deep internally with who Jesus is, where he has changed us, where we are full of grace. The idea of actually putting that seasoning in and marinating, it changes the meat. The flavor of the meat is different in the same way when we are marinated in the gospel, when we are preaching the gospel, this story of the creation and the fall and the redemption and the new creation, when we take that story and we have it born into our hearts and a focus in our hearts, it changes us. Otherwise, all that's happening is you're taking your words, your life, and you're just putting a little seasoning on it as it comes out. And you can tell. And you know the difference between when someone is seasoned with who God is, marinated in it, or when they're throwing it on their words on their way out. Because here's what I notice. The Facebook post, 
the Instagram post and the Twitter feed looks a lot like someone who doesn't know Jesus because it's no, there's no grace involved. It's about the enemy, not about Christ. And they may throw on some seasoning of a few verses here, but the idea of full of grace, grace is getting what I don't deserve. Grace is coming back to the story and say, it's a redemption story. I am broken and I am sinful and I am no better than those people who have a different political view than myself. And so I will not have what comes out of my mouth do anything but honor who Jesus is. This is the essence of it. Number one is he says, understand authority. And number two, be devoted to prayer. And when you have your heart full of grace and seasoned with salt, everything changes. And there's only one way to do this. It's to come back again and again and again and again to the heartbeat of the gospel. This story that I am broken, but God is good. I am a great sinner, but he is a greater savior. There's a picture that I put on a few weeks ago when we were talking about what happens when our tradition and the avenue towards Jesus becomes more important than the destination of who Jesus is. And I've been thinking a lot about this and in terms of this idea full of grace and the idea of, go back to that scripture um, that we were looking at, right? If you're be wise in the way that you act towards outsiders and make the most of every opportunity. Why? Because they don't know Jesus and they need this redemption story and it's so critical. And he says, let your conversation always be full of grace. Why? Because there are lost people and our unity is so critical. He says, that's why you have to be full of grace. And as I was reminiscing, and for some of us, when we looked at these pictures, there's some nostalgia involved because we were in places that looked like this and God moved in our hearts and there were some special things that happened. As I look at this, there's a, a particular part of this that resonates with me and it has to do with this picture right here. When I was growing up in the church, um, this was a great symbol of an immense amount of dissension and disunity and conflict because churches that had hymnals, this is a hymnal, it would be a book that you would use to sing from, Whenever a church made a move to change the, the tradition of how we would sing, there would be dissension and conflict would arise. And some people would actually leave churches because they'd stop using hymnals and they would start using a new technology called an overhead projector. Or God forbid that they added drums or a different type of instrument and there was a lot of tension. People would leave churches over this issue. And I know some of you are thinking, you would leave over music? Yeah, it was very divisive. The latter half of the 20th century, this was the main issue in churches, and some people would come in to try a new church, and they would use a hymnal, and they would just be gone. Forget the mission of the church. Forget the power of the gospel. I don't like the way that you sing. And sadly, I watched this the first 20 years of my life, lived at the end of the 20th century, watching churches fight over this. And I've seen more conflict over the last 10 months in churches than all 20 years combined. Over a few simple issues. Is COVID-19 real? Do we wear masks? What happened with an election? And currently, do we get a vaccine? And I don't know, and honestly, I don't care where you land on any of those, but I'm heartbroken at how we have acted because I don't see a people passionate for God's love and God's truth caring about people whose hearts are broken. I see us caring about our rights. Talk about someone who had rights. Jesus had rights. And he laid them down on a cross and had himself hung there. Because here is the story that matters. This is the redemption story, that there was a fall because of sin, and we're all in that. And Jesus Christ died for our sins. Let me tell you something, there is only one redemption story, and it's Jesus' story. And if you figure out masks properly, and you figure out every election properly, and you figure out vaccines, and you get all of those things sorted out all perfect, here's the problem. You still haven't solved the real problem, the real pandemic in the world. It's called sin, and there's only one cure, and it's Jesus. And while we have been busy fighting amongst ourselves over four issues, a dying world's watching, and they're watching us fight, and they're watching our conflict, and they're saying, hmm, I don't know that I want to be a part of that. 
Starting next week, we're going to look at a new sermon series. It's interesting. The word unity means a whole lot of different things to different people. And right now, we even have to describe what we mean. That in, the, in terms of unity, we don't mean that you just fake it and get along. We mean how do you have unity even when you don't agree. Even when I can't see your point of view. How do we say, but I'm with you. And the reason I'm with you is because Jesus Christ died for our sins. And I'm in that boat with you and I'm on that mission. We won't agree on everything. We may not agree on anything, and that's okay as long as the one thing we do agree on is that Jesus is the only redemption story. There's no redemption with or without masks. There's no redemption with or without a vaccine. The only redemption comes from Jesus Christ, dead on a cross and then risen three days later. As I'm looking at these first six verses and I'm looking at what it means to understand authority and our rights and what I'm understanding about devotion and what you're really praying for, what am I really praying for, and then what does it mean to be full of grace? I'm touched by the rest of the story and the rest of Colossians chapter 4 because starting in verse 7, he just starts listing a bunch of his friends, a bunch of his friends who have bought in to this story, this redemption story. These are people who love Jesus and who are living this life out. And as I was looking at those, the rest of the chapter, I saw three names that stood out to me. And I just want to tell you their stories. The first half of the sermon was about principles. Understand authority, be devoted to prayer, and be full of grace. The second part of it is, how does it practice out? What about real people? And I want to tell you some of their stories. One of them, this is my favorite character in the Bible. His name's Onesimus. He's a Time out, I should clarify. My favorite character is Jesus. You have to say that. That's really, you get in trouble if you don't say that. Jesus is my favorite character. Non-deity, Onesimus is my favorite. And here's the story. Onesimus is actually from Colossae. Crazy story how this all turns out. He's from Colossae. He's actually a bondservant slave from a guy in Colossae. He runs away. He says, I'm done with this. I can't take it anymore. And he runs away. In the process, he leaves Colossae and ends up in Rome where he meets a guy named Paul. And Paul tells him about the goodness of the story of the creation and the fall and the redemption of Jesus Christ and that he's a sinner and he needs Christ. And Onesimus gives his life to Jesus. What an amazing story. But this is where it gets just crazy weird. Ironically, Paul knew someone from Onesimus' past. His owner. He had led his owner to Christ long before. So at some point, a guy named Philemon from Colossae had come into contact with Paul. Let, Paul leads him to Christ. Then years, years later, probably about 15 years later, Onesimus ends up in Rome, running from his master, meets Paul, and here's the redemption story, the amazing story. And he says to him, um, I have an idea for you. I have a letter I want you to deliver. And so when Paul is sending the letter to Colossae, two people take it, a guy named Tychicus and Onesimus. And he says, I want you to bear this letter. Can you imagine Onesimus? Um... You know, I had, I got a doctor appointment on Thursday. I cannot, I can't do it. I can't, I can't be there. And Paul says, actually, I want you to know something. I'm sending two letters. I'm sending the, what will become the book of Colossians that we've been studying. That's the, one of the letters that you and Tychicus will bring, but there's also a personal letter. And Paul writes a personal letter to Philemon, the owner of Onesimus. And in the letter, he says, hey, I'm returning you your slave. I want you to know, if, here's the cool thing, is the, the word Onesimus means useful, Paul plays on that, and he gives a little word play, and he says, um, before he was not useful to you. He had no use to you at all. Now I am returning him to you as a brother in Christ, no longer as a slave, but as a brother. And by the way, if you can't get over it, if you can't walk in forgiveness, whatever he owes, charge it to me. Well, let me give you a little historical reference here. If you want to know what he owes him, according to Roman law, you know, this bond servant thing, if you run away, the pain is death. The price you're going to pay, they're going to kill you. And Paul's saying, charge it to me. Put it on my tab. You want to talk about that masters provide for your slaves? Here's what he's saying. I'm sending you your slave back. Don't you dare forget that the story is this, that you deserve hell. But through the lens of the gospel, Jesus Christ died for you and rose again three days later. Philemon, here's your slave back. No longer as a slave or a bondservant. This is the story of Jesus Christ. And I always wondered, 
You know, the Bible doesn't tell us whether or not Philemon responded. But I know exactly how he responded. Do you want me to tell you how? He took Onesimus back. You know how I know? Because we've seen the letter. The letter of Philemon made it into the Bible. You know why? Because Philemon gets the letter, reads it, and says, church, you need to hear this. Paul sent a second letter. And I know he read it to that church because the book of Colossians and the book of Philemon both make it into the Bible. We don't see the story, but we know the outcome. Philemon would not publicly put out their forgiveness towards his slave unless he had lived it in his heart because your actions always reflect your heart. So there's another name in there, Onesimus, just a treasure in my heart. The second one might, that I want to show you might be another one that makes it in my top five characters, and it's because he's a total bum. It's a total failure. His name's John Mark, and in verse 10, Paul says, also, hey, Aristarchus and John Mark are with me too. I just wanted you to know um, they're doing well. And it seems like, oh, no big deal. Now, this is a huge deal because way back in Acts 13, there was a problem. You see, uh, John Mark had gone with Paul and Barnabas at the very beginning of his ministry, years and years and years before. This is probably about 15 years earlier. Um, John Mark goes with him, makes it one stop and says, I can't do this anymore, and he leaves. He's out of there and he quits. In fact, three chapters later, Paul and Barnabas, they go to each other and say, hey, let's go back and see the churches. And, and Barnabas, who was related to John Mark, says, yeah, let's take John Mark. And Paul's like, no. And Barnabas, who stands up, Paul is like this tough guy. He always just seems like a guy you don't want to get in a tussle with. He's either got a knife either like at his side or he's got one on his lips. You know, like this guy is just, he's got daggers. He just seems harsh. And he says, no. And Barnabas, who's always the gentle guy, stands up and says, uh, yeah, we should take like we're going to take him. And, and Paul says, no. And Barnabas says, yes, no. It gets so heated that the two of them say, we cannot go together because Barnabas is going to take Mark. He's going to take John Mark. And Paul says, I ain't going then. And you think about this. We talk about unity. The two of them, listen to this, they divide over, but then listen to what they do. They both head out together. Neither one of them says a disparaging word about the other. We don't see anything in the text that says that. But Barnabas takes John Mark and they head off to go help the churches, and Paul takes Silas, and the two of them go off. But I want you to notice something. This guy is such a bum in the eyes of Paul that he divides with Barnabas. Barnabas was his mentor for 10 years. Imagine if Paul and I, Pastor Paul, who has been my mentor for the last 14, 15 years, imagine if I said to him, that's enough, and we split. And it was over a guy. And then listen to this. 15 years later, John Mark is in prison with Paul. There's some grace somewhere in there. There's a couple of long conversations because John Mark is with him. At the end of 2 Timothy, the last book that the Apostle Paul writes, he's then separated from John Mark, and he's asking Timothy, hey, can you bring me some things that I need? And one of the things he says, would you bring John Mark? How do you get there? You don't get there. You don't get there be, by being divisive. You get there by being full of grace. And at some point, I wonder if John Mark in his shame and in his guilt had to go apologize to Paul. And I think in reverse, Paul had to say, hey, John Mark, I was wrong. God has done a work in your life. You know, here's what you got to know. Sometimes people bail. Sometimes people fail. And sometimes they grow. We have this, our, our spiritual path where we talk about someone who's a seeker, who becomes a student. They become a follower of Jesus. They hear the gospel story, the redemption story, and they become a follower. And then a servant, and then a steward. And here's what I think happened. John Mark was way back here at the beginning of his journey, and he messed up. And at the beginning, Paul didn't have much grace for that. But I'll tell you, if you ever really want to be a steward who brings people along, you better be full of grace. And I'm inferring this, and just be aware I'm inferring this, and I realize that, is I think Paul had to grow up a little. He always seems like a spiritual giant, but his actions show that he had to make some changes along the way. And it, it just comes back to this, the idea of unity. What kind of conversations happened there? There's one last uh, person in here I want you to see. His name's Luke. Luke uh, is probably one of the more famous names because he wrote one of the books about Jesus. But I want to tell you a little backstory on this. And um, I absolutely love life groups, partly because when we come and we sit down and we open God's word, we see things that we didn't see before. There's stuff in there that, that someone brings up, and I'm like, I didn't see that. And so I would like to personally thank my Thursday morning life group, uh, a bunch of guys that meet at 6.30 at the Green Campus in the 
I specifically on this one, I want to thank you, Jason. You, you showed something I hadn't seen before. But I, there's this thing that we were doing a couple weeks ago. We were looking at the journey of the Apostle Paul, and he's with Silas, and it's on their second journey. And they get up to Lystra, and they were like, let's go to Asia, and that's the plan. They were going to go head up there, head towards the Silk Road. They are going to connect. The Silk Road didn't exist yet, but follow along, you know. They're going to go up towards Asia. They're going to be there in China. They're going to connect with all those people. And that was just his heart. And the Holy Spirit said, eh, no. I don't want you to do that. And they're like, yeah, let's, let's go. And, and the Holy Spirit said, no. And so they continue on. And they just decide that they're going to head west. And they go two stops later. And there's this really fascinating part that happens. The entire verbiage of the text changes. Remember, they wanted to go up here. And the Holy Spirit said no. And in the process, when they're at Troas, something amazing happens. And it's the way the book is written. It's in chapter 16. This crazy little thing happens. 16.10. All of a sudden, the pronoun changes in the book because the author of the book of Acts is a guy named Luke. And in the middle of it, you find that he suddenly is not just telling the story, he's in it. And I was just thinking back, what happens when you're traveling along and you want to go this way? And the Holy Spirit says, no, you never know what may happen. You may pick up another person along the way that may be a part of writing God's word. He wrote two books of the New Testament, and I'm inferring this because it doesn't say, and because they didn't go to Asia, and because they went west, they ended up finding Luke. But boy, it's fascinating, because if, if you've ever been in this position where you have an idea that this is where we should go, and in the process, God says no, and then if you can look back from years later, you say, oh man, look what he was doing. What if I had fought against God and stayed over there? Sometimes God has waiting for you someone that's going to be a part of the story, and you can't imagine in any other way. Luke, the author of the book of Luke, the story of Jesus, and the book of Acts, written by a guy they pick up along the journey. I'm so grateful for people who follow what God has called them to do. Well, I'm going to release to our campuses. We love you, and we're going to ask a couple questions at each of our campuses.